The enormous combined British and French offensive, the Battle of the Somme, had begun last week, and this week saw a lesson play out hopefully someone would learn. When you have many, many units attacking and you don't coordinate those attacks, you die. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to The Great War. Last week, as I said, the Battle of the Somme had begun, and the British took 57,000 casualties in one day, the largest one-day total of the war. Alexei Brusilov's Russian offensive was still smashing through the Austro-Hungarian lines, but far to the north, General Evert was being whipped by the Germans, and in the Middle East, Mecca fell to the Arab Revolt. Here's what came next. Well, the Somme was in full swing in the west. By its second week, it had become a day-to-day -day fight for small woods and villages. You had La Boiselle falling on the 6th. You had Contal Maison taken by the British on the 7th and then lost to the Germans that evening. On the 8th, the British captured most of Trone Wood, but a German counterattack forced them out. In each of these attacks, hundreds of men were killed and thousands more were wounded. Still, by the 9th and 10th, the Germans had been pushed back as many as two or three kilometers in places. In this phase of the battle, British General Headquarters repeatedly reported that the Germans were on the verge of collapse. General Sir Henry Rawlinson seemed to see his role in things as just a conduit to pass along such messages to corps commanders. What he did not do was use 4th Army Headquarters to make sure attacks were simultaneous or supported by as much artillery as possible. You can really see the results of this style of command. For example, between July 3rd and 10th, the 23rd Division of 3rd Corps attacked Contal Maison eight times, right? Just to their right, at that same period, the 17th Division of 15th Corps launched 11 attacks against the next trenches over. Not one single time did these attacks happen simultaneously, and only once did one corps artillery assist the other corps. So those divisions took huge casualties for pretty small advances. On the 12th, Mamed's Wood was taken, and on the 14th, a push through the German lines that would hopefully yield Longueval and Bazantan, the Battle of Bazantan Ridge, began, which we'll see next week. Now, Mamet's Wood was interesting. It was about a square mile big. A division that had not yet seen battle, the Welsh 38th, took over from the 7th Division on July 5th. Now, the 7th Division had done well back on the 1st by using creeping barrage techniques, and they had even specifically stated it was a big reason for their success. But nobody passed this info on to the Welsh, who would attack without it. They attacked from July 7th through the 11th on seven occasions. These happened just about every time with no support from either flank. The whole operation was a mess, though it got better after the 10th, when they finally began to use creeping barrages. But in just five days, that division took 4,000 casualties, including seven of its 12 battalion commanders. Still, after the first 13 days of the Battle of the Somme, British casualties stood at 85,000. But even though it was a bunch of narrow front attacks, most often without sufficient artillery that enabled Germany to concentrate its reserves, they did take a bunch of fortified positions in a fairly short time period. On July 1st, they'd taken three square miles. From the 2nd to the 13th, they took 20. So as long as they were willing to disregard the enormous casualties, this was a period of steady achievement. The Germans were, of course, not on the brink of collapse, but they were in some disarray. These operations were happening where their lines had been overrun back on the 1st. Also, a lot of the German batteries had been knocked out by French and British artillery, and a big third. German High Command insisted that every fragment of territory lost be immediately recovered. So by this time, all the German reserves in the area had been used. A tactical withdrawal could have been a good idea, but when one commander planned to do such a thing, he was sacked by German Army Chief of Staff Eric von Falkenhayn, who issued orders to counterattack to the last man. Here is a quote from the Somme by Robin Pryor and Trevor Wilson. It is important to take note of this directive. We have witnessed so many examples of ineptitude on the part of the British command that it is important to remember that they could be equaled or exceeded by the Germans whenever the opportunity presented. The Germans were launching some offensive of their own this week at Verdun, now in its fifth month of battle. 
They were again trying to take Fort Souville, and at midnight July 10th began shelling the French with Green Cross gas shells containing deadly phosgene gas. To not repeat their mistake of June 23rd, they continued shelling the French with gas until well after their infantry were on the move. Silence spread among the French guns. The Germans advanced into the dawn, and suddenly a barrage of 75mm field guns blasted from the entire French lines. Huge gaps were torn in the German lines, and within a matter of minutes, the advance was stopped and the Germans retreated or dug in. What had happened was that the French had a new and more effective gas mask, and they had just patiently held their fire until the enemy revealed himself. There were German advances that day, though. Attacks and counterattacks, and the Bavarian Alpine Corps punched a hole 400 meters deep in the French lines. German flamethrowers took out a whole French battalion, killing or capturing 33 of its officers and 1,300 men. By nightfall, the Germans had captured 2,400 French prisoners and knocked out the Fort Souville garrison with artillery. On the 11th, a couple dozen German soldiers reached the outer wall of the fort and raised their flag. They could see the twin towers of Verdun Cathedral two miles away. But inside the fort were 60 French soldiers under Lieutenant Kleber Dupuis. They went out and retook the outer wall. Verdun was still secure. And the French ally Russia in the east was secure as well. On the 9th, Stavka told General Alexei Brusilov that he was entrusted with the battle of decision. The day before, the Russian advance had reached Delatin, less than 50 kilometers from the Hungarian border. But General Platon Leshitsky had lost 70,000 men since the beginning of July, so he had to take a pause to regroup. Then German reinforcements arrived to defend the Stockhard River, and the Russians were unable to pass it this week. Still, for the five weeks of battle, the Russians had taken 300,000 prisoners and looked pretty good. And a personal note that I didn't have time to mention last month that partly deals with Russia. Back on June 5th was the trial of philosopher Bertrand Russell. He was fined 100 pounds for distributing a leaflet supporting conscientious objection. That same day, another philosopher, Ludwig Wittgenstein, was fighting the Russians at Okna with the Austro-Hungarian army. And for his bravery there, Lance Corporal Wittgenstein won the silver medal for valor second class. Apparently, he had ignored his officers' yells to take cover and continued observing mortar fire until he could locate the attacking heavy mortars so his battery could take them out. And yet another side note I haven't mentioned yet. Back on June 21st, U.S. troops fought Mexican troops at Carrizal. Blackjack Pershing's forces were looking for Pancho Villas, but they ran into Mexican army troops. They attacked anyhow and were beaten back. This caused enough tension between Mexico and the U.S. that war seemed possible. I just thought that deserved mention. And the week ends with dozens of micro-battles raging at the Somme, the Germans coming close to the prize at Verdun, and the Russians taking more ground in the east. It's easy to look back and say, what was Rawlinson thinking? Of course, all the smaller attacks at the Somme should have been coordinated. But hang on, Rawlinson, or any other British commander, had never had to deal with forces of this magnitude before. British power had rested on its navy. Before the war, the only fighting the army was doing was colonial stuff, and that was minuscule compared to the Somme. So you may be inclined to cut Rawlinson some slack. Then you think about the thousands upon thousands of men that needlessly died in those uncoordinated attacks. and You don't cut him slack anymore. If you're interested in Mexico's situation during World War I, you can check out our special episode about that right here. Our Patreon supporter of the week is Tom McCool. Please consider supporting us on Patreon so that we can make this show even better. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.